नीरा बैठ जा दिस इज बेटर ऑडियो दिस इज बेटर ही इज आस्किंग या 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 ओके वी आर लाइव नाउ दैट आई डन दैट इज समदर लैपटॉप हुज लैपटॉप इज दैट चलो बात कर दे सर सेम ओके आई हैव टू चार्ज इन लगा ही लेते हैं ये बंद की है चलो बात टेक पे I think we can start, Anita. Yeah. A very good evening and a happy World Optometry Day to one and all. On behalf of Optometry Council of India, I welcome you all to this most awaited panel discussion about the NCAHP Act. On the 21st of March 2021, the longest standing bill in the history of the Indian Parliament became an act and brought in a lot of joy especially to the Indian Optometry Fraternity after years of struggle. Last year the interim council was announced and the ministry of health and family welfare announced the optometrists for the interim commission whom we have amongst us today as panelists up front we have mr aditya goel principal of shankara college of optometry and dr venkatramna kalkivai head of department at ahalya school of optometry joining them today is ms lakshmi shinde the ceo of Optometry Council of India as well as the executive manager for global education with the International Association for Contact Lens Educators moderating this session today is Dr Neerav Mehta who is the principal at Harijot College of Optometry at Navsari Gujarat so let's sit back and hear it out from our esteemed panelists on the how and what of the NCAHP act so over to you neerav and welcome all once again So first of all, welcome all, and um, uh, wishing all of them a world happy World Optometry Day. So I think we can start with uh, everyone can say happy World Optometry Day. So happy World Optometry Day. Okay, so uh, uh, this is a very different uh, setup because we are uh, doing something uh, live, and I will be asking questions and. probably the ncahp act is something everyone is uh, thinking and what 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 it is and probably some of the questions which i have maybe this questions all of them must be having it uh, let's see how how it goes but i am very eager to know the answers and uh, some of the answers definitely uh, will change our thought process and a uh, lot of questions with me i have kept it so we'll start with uh, lakshmi ma'am so ma'am Can you tell me what is the NCHP Act first? Thank you, Neera, and thanks, Anita, and happy World Optometry Day to everybody. And what a you know fit occasion to discuss uh, such an important thing in the profession as well. Um, NCHP Act, the full form of that is National Commission uh, for Allied and Healthcare Professionals. Uh, it regulates, uh, I think, around five fifty-six uh, professions. Some of them are allied. and uh, five professions are under healthcare uh, optometry being one of them apart from optometry we have physiotherapy uh, nutrition um, occupational therapy then uh, physician assistant and optometry as well so these are the only five uh, healthcare professions that are being uh, regulated through this act um, as far as the national commission for allied and healthcare is concerned yeah so uh, thank you ma'am Uh, how uh, how do you see uh, aditya sir how do you see this act is going to helpful for us uh, the profession uh, see uh, first of all we did not have any legislation till now for optometry so this is a welcome uh, change i should say and uh, it is not an act which is going to change anything but then basically it is going to bring about legality in the profession so it is not to change things but bring about legality in education as well as practice of optometry so the basic change if you really ask me you can consider is that uh, it is going to bring about a standardization of education which has been very haphazard 
as well as practice of optometry, which is going to be standardized from now on, which again was haphazard. Okay, uh, good, good to know that, sir. Uh, another uh, question for uh, Venkat, uh, Venkat Raman, sir. Uh, I am also in the more in education. So how, how uh, we should look education in terms of quality? Because I think this act can work on that area as well. So how do you think uh, how this can uh, really change it? Uh, good evening all. <coughs> Happy World Optometry Day. Before I start answering your question. Yeah, it, it will definitely improve the quality of education in India. You see, as uh, Adi was telling you, it, we are getting into legalization process. So, yeah, it will improve the infrastructure, quality of faculties, number of faculties, number of students intake. All these norms will be, you know, it's there will be a standardization for all optometry colleges across India. So, definitely quality of education is definitely going to increase after implementation of this. Okay, sir. Just to add uh, something to what uh, Ramna just mentioned, we are going to look at a completely ratified curriculum. We are going to look at competency levels which on which the curriculum is going to be based. We are going to inspect every single college of optometry for its infrastructure as well as the faculty norms. So everything is going to be standardized. So once the things are standardized and a minimum is followed, obviously the education- Automatically the, yeah. Sorry? Yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, just in view of that, uh, Neera, if you don't mind, I just want to ask something yes, in, in the same yes. line. So um, um, Adi and uh, KVR. So basically, uh, you know, people, the, the understanding that people have is as far as the act was uh, passed was that we get a lot of rights, uh, practicing rights, ABC and all of that. So I think, uh, you know, now it's looking at starting from scratch in the sense, first you look at education, you standardize education, you bring about a curriculum. And then after that, you're going to look at practice and stuff like that. And both or both can happen simultaneously. Uh, it's just a comment. So you want to comment on the same thing because yeah. So whenever you talk of NCHP, the first thing that uh, young optometrists or, uh, you know, uh, practicing optometrists think is, Acha, abhi li license mil jayega, abhi ye practice karenge, wo practice karenge. So, you know, just to clarify that, uh, you want to say something? Yeah, so uh, obviously it is going to be a registered license practice and uh, whatever is illegal is illegal and that will be brought to the notice of the public and public will get to know what exactly optometry is and all the 56 professionals like you mentioned. So just to add the madam's question, it's we have to register the uh, point in it. So where to register, how to be registered on this uh, for the optometry? Okay, uh, to answer that question, frankly, we are yet not ready with the portal. It is in the making. And once the portal is ready, then it will be uh, publicized to everybody in the country. And you can enroll on that. And after enrollment, all that will be, uh, all the data will be transferred to the state councils and the state council will register the optometrists and also the educational institutions. So it is not that anyone and everyone can start an optometry college. So they will have to register and it will be a registered standardized education. So you mean to say the existing institutes also have to register, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. absolutely yeah. Okay. But the portal is not ready as yet. Not yet, not yet yeah. ready. So uh, they are working on it. In fact, we had a meeting uh, yesterday and day before yesterday. So we did go through. So certain uh, information is privileged. So we cannot uh, right. reveal that. The, the duration, if you ask me, I can't answer that question straight away. But then, yes, it is being worked on. So just to talk further on what you're just saying about registering institutions, let's say uh, there are four or five colleges. Uh, I'm just giving just an example. Okay. So if you are not in that portal, then you're not considered to be running a course, right? So if you have uh, to well, add... it, is, it has got nothing to do with the portal as such, but every college should be registered. Uh, every that's what college will have, have to undergo. 
Uh, yes. So every college will have to undergo the norms of the council. And again, uh, something uh, that we got to know, we had uh, people from dental council also come and speak to us day before yesterday, as well as the nursing council. So the education, health education is central subject. Correct. Yeah. So everyone will have to go through the council. So you might have been running the college for past 40, 50 years, but that does not matter. Hmm. You have to go through that, get it re-registered or uh, ratified and then go through it. And earlier, okay, uh, one more thing I'd like to inform you is earlier we used to think of only university affiliation. Hmm. So it is not university affiliation alone. It is going to be university affiliation plus NOC from the council. Council also. Yeah. Yes, that is mandatory. Uh, like sir, I, like it's yes. happening in other councils, dental council, nursing council. This is what it happens. So same thing will be followed here also. Yes. So just to continue with the same question, how how we can relate with the course uh, designs and everything? Because somewhere it is three plus one course design and another where we have a different thing. So how how this can be regulated on on that norms? Like we the standard. What should be the standard and how how that can? Ramna, you want to take the question? Uh, yeah, uh, you see, that's where the council comes into the role, actually. So the council sets up the norms and everyone follows it. And there will be a standard uh, uh, duration of the course for UG, PG, etc. So, yeah, the council is, you know, uh, doing the things uh, in such a way that everyone is, uh, you know, benefited. Sabka saath, sabka vikas. You know, that slogan you should remember and uh, the people are acting in such a direction. So things are set into a standard and uh, yeah, the standard protocol will be maintained throughout India across all the colleges. So what about- to Add on uh, Nero. Yes. <clears throat> so we are looking at absolute standardized nomenclature. Uh, yeah, that's- Whatever it may be, B optom, baccalaureate optometry, whatever, it is going to be a standardized nomenclature for both bachelors and masters. Secondly, it is going to be a standardized duration. Four years, four and a half years, five years is going to be standardized. So it is not going to be like one college says, I'll do two, three and a half years plus six months. One college says, I'll do only three years. Other college says, I'll do six years. It is going to be a standardized duration of the program plus internship. A mandatory internship will be there for one year. The third thing that we are going to look at is a minimum curriculum. So every college across the country will have to go through the minimum curriculum based on the minimum competency that are required for the bachelor as well as for the masters. So that minimum curriculum will have to be followed. Over and above that, you can teach what you like. So these are the basic rules that we are following for the colleges, for education. Sorry, sir, uh, just to again, one more point, like how about diploma holders related to this in that? Diploma has been stopped for your good uh, knowledge. Uh, Madam Lakshmi wrote that document where 2020, all the diplomas were supposed to stop. And if they are still continuing, anything illegal can continue, but it is illegal. So it will be very clearly mentioned on the website of National Commission of Allied and Healthcare Professions that Optometry is a four-year degree program for with 3,600 hours of teaching. So diplomas will not be able to follow that and they will be, so over a period of time, they'll be rooted out. We and diploma that, Yeah, we need to clarify that uh, Adi, because they might be confusing this with ophthalmic assistant. Ah, uh, so. Diploma in optometry, not ophthalmic assistant. So diploma in ophthalmic assistant will continue. Diploma in vision technician will continue, but again, as per the uh, ISCO, International Labor Organization, they have certain uh, guidelines for the practice rights. So they, that is the ophthalmic assistant, as well as vision technician, comes as uh, allied profession and not healthcare profession. So they cannot practice independently. Only optometrists with four-year degree, a minimum four-year degrees, and 3,600 hours of teaching 
can practice independently. Okay. Sir, again, coming back to you, uh, the question to Lakshmi ma'am. So now uh, we are looking on the NCHP Act on the point, but how then OCI is going to relate with the, uh, I'm sure the documentation has been done so much from the NCHP Act. So how it is going to help? Uh, You're asking uh, about the relevance, relevance of the OCI. Of the OCI okay. how, how it is going to be yeah. more benefited to optometry practitioners in future. Uh, I think this is just the beginning. You know, see, as uh, Aditya and KVR were saying, we've been doing a lot of advocacy at the government level, uh, be it, uh, you know, stopping the diploma in optometry, uh, not ophthalmic assistance, stopping the diploma in optometry. And then after that, now looking at state councils and all of that. So that advocacy will still continue. And I think the role of OCI is also going to be like tomorrow, if there is uh, something that we are not in agreement with, okay, if the government bring, brings up some rule, although we have representatives in the center, if there is something that we are not in agreement with, there is always a body with which you can, um, you know, voice out your concerns. I think that is going to be one of the major roles of uh, OCI. And secondly, I also see a lot of uh, activities related to continuing education. I think uh, we were the first body to bring about CE credits uh, for renewal and all of that, which is now going to be adopted by the government as well. So I feel that there will be more role on increasing the standards of uh, practitioners. That's That I feel is a very, very important role. And as well as even implementing the NCHP Act. This is not that once it's passed that tomorrow, everything is going to be great, right? So. I think the, the process is going to take time uh, and we will definitely try and be, uh, you know, uh, do a lot of advocacy with the government until the last mile where it is implemented. I think that's going to be our role. So again, uh, related to this uh, Ma'am's question on Ma'am's point on how OCI, how OCI, uh, the credit points have been taken and all this uh, continuing education has been taken related. So in government, how this uh, is going to help? probably related to this or uh, what what norms we can find, uh, find out, maybe something related to state government uh, associations or is it going to uh, implied in it? Well, you know, these are early times, so I don't think we can uh, comment on that at this point of time, how the, the act or the council is going to take up uh, C credits as well as, so we are in discussion about everything. But uh, if you really want an uh, answer in black and white, I cannot provide you any answer right now. Okay, so, and moreover, the associations will continue. Mm. There's nothing like one association should not continue, others should continue. It is up to the individual to decide which association they want to be associated with, and they should be associated with associations. When you have a council, it is mandatory, but council uh, understand is not Council is a regulatory body. Council is not an association. It is not a group of your peers. You have to associate with your peers if you want to grow. So whether you are with OCI or IOA or uh, uh, ASCO or whatever, whatever, there are plenty of organizations and there are plenty of associations. Now it is up to you to decide who you want to be associated with. If all, well and good. If not all, you select. So joining an association is never mandatory. But if you really ask me over a period of years, I am a member of so many associations and I find some good in every association, including uh, international associations. Yes. Uh, so a uh, lot of uh, new points are coming up. <laughs> uh, so another uh, KVL, sir, like, uh, uh, how this act will change in the admission and the eligibility process, like meet and everything. How, what, what points you would like to highlight on? Ramla, you want to answer and I add in later? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. See, the, uh, see, government of India wants all the healthcare professions to fall under meet. So, yeah, we are a healthcare profession, so we should also go into that. Yeah. So. Again, having discussions on uh, the admission, eligibility, etc. 
The current thought process is that all the admissions should happen through NEET. I cannot answer on the timeline. It will not happen this year for sure. When it's going to happen, probably next year, probably next to next year, we can't answer that because like I said, we are in early times right now. Yeah. Uh, sitting over there, we understand the, uh, the speed at which things work. Sitting over there, we understand at what level we are working and at what level other things are working. And believe me, we are talking of one of the 56 professions. Correct. For the government, it is not uh, optimistic. Yeah. Then it is a very small thing. For us, it may be big. For us, it's huge. But then for government, it is one of the 56. Right? Okay. So, uh, in relation to this, um, Adi, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Just a yeah, second. I can hear you. Yeah. Can you hear we me? Can hear. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yes, yes. So in relation to this, I just wanted to ask, like, you know, when we did the model curriculum, which has been ratified, uh, we also said that institutions could have, uh, you know, their own entrance exams and interviews and all of that. So their own what? Entrance exam and interviews. Entrance exam. Okay. So, you know, need is very broad um, in terms of, um, let's say, the aptitude of the person to join into an eye care profession and stuff like that. So do you see that in the future, like even for engineering, we all have a common entrance. Right. I mean, I'm just taking a, a analogy, okay? Yeah. But at the same time, you uh, you write the CET or you write the All India this thing. But then individual colleges also have sometimes their own entrance and interviews uh, or counseling. Uh, they might call it counseling. So is this a possibility for optometry also that you know um, certain colleges or colleges who want to do it can be given the option of you know, uh, shortlisting certain people through need, but at the same time have an aptitude test or something like that. Because uh, we all know that, you know, uh, especially in 12, uh, you know, having uh, my children gone through that and all of that. So you know that they are quite indecisive and uh, need, like sometimes they just write. Like there's a lot of people who just write, you know. Okay. Uh, I'll take that question. <clears throat> now, need is going to be a common umbrella. Now, there are institutions like All India Institute of Medical Sciences or IITs or uh, IAMs or plenty of such institutions, which are institutes of excellence. Yeah. Okay. So, there is a proper procedure to attain that status. Uh, okay. In the Ministry of HRD, there is a proper state, uh, procedure to attain that status. If any organization is able to attain that status, well and good, they can have their own. Uh, okay. Yeah. But otherwise, it has to be based on need. That is a present thinking. Okay. When it's going to be implemented, and if at all it's going to be implemented, I can't answer that question right now. Okay. Now, the other thing that I also... Uh, you Blackout, know, I don't know why. No, no, don't worry. Um, okay. Okay, I'm going to just keep talking. You can hear me, right? Yeah, yeah I can hear you. Okay. So, I'm going to keep talking. So... Um, we said that you have all the colleges, both to KVR and you, the colleges have to register is what you said. Um, uh, once the portal is uh, ready, all the education institutions have to register. Now, um, would an institution or an organization which has got NAC accreditation or NABH uh, be at a, you know, advantage uh, or something like that, or it really doesn't matter? No, no, no. Everyone is on the same in the same boat. Okay. okay. So there's no specific advantage of an institution having NAC accreditation or the hospital having NABH accreditation or uh, a lab having NABL accreditation. They have their uh, sense like they can publicize their own institute as being something big or something good. I but get it. Yeah. From the perspective of admission or need or anything, they do not have any advantage. And again, from the perspective of uh, registration on portal, there's no ranking as of now. 
Okay. But you see that that would happen in the future in terms of ranking. I don't know. I don't okay. know. I can't answer it's that. It's too early to answer, Lakshmi. Okay. Uh, sir, on that same note, where how, how the faculty and other things would be. Yeah, uh, just, uh, just uh, sorry, Nirav, uh, just to answer that back. Now, the ranking is not done by councils. Yes. It is going to be some kind of association. For example, in uh, US, the entrance exam for optometry, the OAT, is conducted by ASCO USA. Hmm. Okay, so they have the ranking over there and they are able to produce that. Correct. So similar system, like uh, going back to your earlier question about associations. Hmm. Now, associations can become academies. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's where I see the role. Yeah. So it, it, uh, it really depends how the things turn around. So we do not know. But the council definitely will not be uh, ranking any of the institutions. Yeah. Yeah, so... The same, I think awesome. and I'll say this question about the standardizing the faculties and other norms or uh, any anything related to that in any in, in CHPA. We did have a discussion on faculty development programs yesterday as well as day before yesterday. So that is on the anvil from the ministry perspective, from the council perspective. How that's going to happen? We have to work it out. Yeah, so, I so currently, okay, uh, let me just uh, clarify that was not for optometry faculty alone, that is generic faculty, generic teaching methodologies, not subject specific. Okay, so the pool of people who intend to be faculties, they should come into that fold and uh, take those uh, courses, get into proper teaching methodologies, and then subject specific can be taught or they should know. So this is like <coughs> an overall pedagogic program or, you know, evidence-based right. uh, teaching right. and stuff yes. like that is exactly. what will be covered. Yes. And then you kind of tailor make it for optometry um, if you are an optometry faculty. So that's very nice. That's nice. Okay. So again, I'll come back to ma'am related. We were discussing about the association and the continuing education part. So how we look or how students should look, how OCI is going to look for continuing education, does it, we are looking that standard of American Academy of Optometry, uh, that are we heading towards that area where, uh, so what what exactly is the take on? Uh, sorry Hi. to interrupt you, Nira, before Lakshmi answers that. Why should we look at American Academy and of Optometry? I was about to say that. Yeah, exactly. I was or about American to say Academy that. Academy of Optometry. Yeah. We know our problems better. Yeah. No, uh, uh, you know, every, uh, I don't want to be negative in any way with any any country's association or whatever. But everything has a cycle, you know, uh, goes up, comes down, goes up, comes down, and all of that. So I feel um, we are in the up mode as far as Indian optometry is concerned. Um, and uh, I'm sure uh, Aditya and KBR would agree that in olden days, there were hardly any continuing education programs uh, that were available, whereas now you can find at least two to three. I don't know about the standard of uh, some of them, but at least there are two to three every month. That is uh, occurring. Uh, forget the standard. The very the very uh, concept of continuing education is happening. Um, so I think that's a huge change that we can uh, see as far as Indian optometry is concerned. Um, the second thing I feel is... Uh, um, sometimes what happens is um, students attend the continuing education programs to fill in gaps mm -hmm. that are not taught in college and should, should have been taught in college. I think that trend needs to change and practitioners sh should invest in education. That I don't see that happening uh, much. Okay, So you are in a healthcare profession. You are earning from that profession. That profession is giving you money. You need to reinvest some amount into edu continuing education. Otherwise, you will be redundant. Okay, uh, I'll give you a small uh, example. We've moved from plain mirrors to, mm. you know, uh, stuff. And we've moved from two position keratometers to topography, right? Uh, so if you are in practice and if you can't upgrade yourself, with the change, with equipments, with technology, with uh, uh, 
you know, approaching patients in a different way, then the practice itself is going to become redundant. You can't complain saying that you're not getting support in the profession if you have not upgraded yourself. So I, I think continuing education has a huge role uh, to play as far as uh, healthcare, any healthcare profession, not only optometry, I'm talking about any healthcare uh, profession that is concerned. And I, I feel that it's more of students who attend conferences uh, rather than practitioners. And we would like more and more practitioners to attend and upgrade uh, themselves. You know, the, the normal excuse is, are uh, clinic ko chodna padta hai and all of that. But you should also look at the advantages of what you're getting to learn, right? Uh, if you don't upgrade, then it's very difficult. So again, continuing to- Totally agree with her. Practitioners need to come back to the study table. Correct. Practitioners need to invest some money. They may be investing in a lot of automated equipment, a lot of uh, inventories, etc., etc. Again, I this is my personal opinion. I see optometry clinics of 10,000 square feet with 50 square feet given for the clinic. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Okay. So I think we need to give something to the profession also. And for that, we need to invest in terms of time, energy, and money. These three things are essential for growth. Further growth, otherwise, we will not be able to grow any further. So updation and upgradation of knowledge is absolutely essential. Yes, like what she said, it is the students who fill up the halls in the conferences, in the CMEs. But then, where are the practitioners? So so that trend has to change, actually. Hopefully, once see there is so much of updation is happening in the science, that too, particularly in optometry, so many varieties of equipment, etc., etc. So until and unless the, the practitioners come into the education mode, attending the CMEs, etc., etc., I think that will take the optometry practice to the next level. Yes. And just to give you a small example, Neera, uh, whenever I visit any international conference, it is 80% practitioners and probably about 15-20%. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. In India, it is reverse. absolutely reverse. It's yeah. maybe about 10% practitioners and 90-95% uh, students. So students, obviously, uh, if you're talking of, uh, let's say, advanced contact lenses, what will a first-year student understand? I'm talking about neuro optometry. What will first year, second year optometry student understand? It is the practitioners who should be sitting on the tables, right? And that is what is going to improve the quality also, because they will be able to ask questions and that is going to improve our quality. And I also think, Adi, uh, you know, of course, this is very far-fledged thinking, but uh, once the register is made and, you know, renewal of licensure becomes a compulsion, uh, I think they would be forced uh, to come to the table, uh, you know, but hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. yes, as I said, hopefully <laughs> they would be forced to <laughs> thinking. Yeah, we've been doing a lot of that, isn't it? Because for medical practitioners, it, work, it is uh, endeavor to do that, but they don't do it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the same thing, I think what I, I know this might be a very early to speak about uh, the credit points. Does this council will also have those norms in it? Probably. Just a question related. So as we are looking into the future perspective, uh, as uh, uh, practitioners to be incorporated more in education future. So, yeah, so uh, yeah, we uh, definitely would definitely love to have that. But current problems are uh, uh, more numerous as compared to the C credit awarding at this point of time. Current problems of uh, your education standards, current problems of your practice standards, that is more important registrations yeah. and the most important issue is getting the state all the states into the councils yeah. that is the biggest problem that we're facing second problem that we're facing is the discrepancy from the act that the states are following yeah yeah that's something yeah, yeah. so how, how is the current problems 
how do we need to highlight on this act to students or the practitioners and where they should know about all these things or it is all there in black and white it is a, yeah. anyone google for it you get it no as a an institute how whether they should be aware about where what what is the current situation in optometry uh, when they are taking admissions or when they are been coming up or, or what 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 should be done is it miro miro can i answer this adi yes yes sir. Uh, please uh uh nero this see every optometrist every faculty every student must read this act from first word to last word every time i read i admire the hard work put behind this actually so it was like you know this 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 work you know extremely laudable work actually what the commission has done they have written it so nicely i think everybody has to read this i i just have a recommendation maybe we need to include this as part of the curriculum as well uh, mm -hmm. so that people are aware um, students uh, as well as faculty and everything lakshmi <clears throat> it is as it is a part of the curriculum we have something called law and optometry yes, yeah, yes. we have law and yeah. Yeah. part yes. of a yeah. Uh, curriculum and bachelor's program. So obviously, till now we did not have an act. We did not have yeah, a law. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So I yeah. think we're not talking about it. But part. now that we have it, obviously it becomes a part of the curriculum. So obviously the lawyers are going to be talking about it. The practitioners are going to be talking about it. So it becomes a definitely a part of the curriculum. Yeah, yeah. But apart from the act, I think what all our students as well as the practitioners, practitioners should read yeah. is high locks. Yeah, yeah. The Indian entry level. optometry competency document they should read what they supposed to be what we endeavored them to be so that is very important for all of us the few documents we have such beautiful documents they have been taken up by uh, different countries and very surprising we had this osicon recently five uh, maha utsavs I was very surprised that most of the people were not even aware of those uh, documents. Forget reading them. Our faculties were not aware of those documents. Forget reading them. How are we teaching? And if our faculties are not aware of them, how do you expect the students to be aware of them? So these are fantastic documents that have been made, and like you said, laudable efforts have been made. Huge amount of uh, infrastructure, energy. Time, money, everything yeah. gone into doing them. They have been there for ages. I think uh, we should. Yeah. Need yeah. of just to you, you answered your own question. Like you were asking the role of OCI, and then later you asked about C credits, right? Mm -hmm. So this can be a, an area where OCI advocates to the government that you know in future we need to have C credits. It does yes. help, and you need to you know upgrade. Uh, one's knowledge before uh, renewing the license and all of that. So, um, you know, I I don't know whether I can say this in public, but I will still say uh, they were comments uh, that were passed in, in the initial days of discussion with the ministry, where Adi was also present uh, in a few meetings, where they said that uh, among the fifty six professions, they said we're not really concerned about optometry because you have everything in place. Mm -hmm. You have your curriculum in place. You have your competency in place. You have Uh, you know, um, C credits C credit. as part of this thing. So they said uh, we have not seen another profession which is so well, well organized. organized in terms of documentation than compared to other professions. I know that uh, physiotherapy does things much much better, but I think uh, they were quite appreciative of what uh, we have done on our own without any support. And just uh, a little bit of revelation, which I I think I can make public. Yesterday, it was decided to put that entire ILOC, the latest ILOC document that was uh, published in 21, 2021, as it is in the curriculum document. They have decided to incorporate that. So yesterday, it was decided that, as such, the entire document will be incorporated in the in the curriculum, and all the other professions will be recommended to do something similar. Documents and yeah, similar. Uh, base the yeah. curriculum based on that. See, that's that's huge, right? That's that's huge for us as a profession. I think you know, showing showing the way for other healthcare professions to do 
uh, something similar. So yeah, hats off to you yeah, guys. Now, now that is the value and strength of associations. Correct. Right. right? Yeah. This document was written by ASCO India. ASCO India. Okay. And what is ASCO India? After all, an association. We have no government funding. We have no government stamp. We have nothing. But then we wrote that. And now it has become a government document. Right? So similarly, every association has its value. I think over a period of time, you realize that value. Yeah. So another related, uh, we are having so many other stakeholders and all. So looking at the industry perspective, how they will be there in the NCHP Act, how, what is the role of industry? If you, if you want to start with it. Uh, you mean corporates? Corporates. Related uh, like ophthalmic lens, contact lens, and uh, or how OCI looks into that. Uh, I don't know about, see, I don't see a role of corporates in the NCHP Act. I mean, in the sense like they will benefit from it, but I don't see them actively taking part in anything. I mean, this is my understanding. I might be wrong. They can correct me. It is like how medical council functions uh, versus uh, Indian Medical Association. You know? So Indian Medical Association might work with companies and products and all of that. Whereas the medical council is a government body and uh, they are, they standardize, make rules for regulation of the profession. I don't think there's any corporate involvement uh, as far as the government um, act is concerned. Um, as far as OCI is concerned, I think, uh, you know, it we kind of in, in some way, maybe looking at something similar like the Indian Medical Association, where we are looking at uh, partnering with different industries to bring good uh, standard of continuing education um, and that's where we see our role but um, as far as nchp act i would leave it to them i agree with her i don't think uh, there's any specific role that we see uh, as of date yeah so uh, probably most of the questions and i we can understand still we are at the very earliest stage of understanding so many things are on the working ahead uh, one message or one point which you like to share, like uh, how institute should uh, or a university, maybe something like implementation, where to start some implementation process. So I think that can start from the education perspective and uh, then it can go more into the registration and other things. So I think KVR uh, can think on from that level. Uh, hello, Neera? Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So the question is, uh, yeah, question is about no, repeat, how, repeat the question. Yeah. Yeah. Question is about the university related. Like, if I if I have the education, how we look into that perspective, the implementation of the syllabus or the ILOCs and everything. Yeah. Uh, the institute needs to implement so that this uh, standardization has to be done. So what what? Yeah way we can do that or what all the universities because then the standardization process would go into it and then the uh, registration and then the more process can continue yeah no you see once the once the norms are set by the council and the, all the universities must follow these norms okay so you see everything is clear in the uh, 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 in the document what the uh, council is going to share to all the universities they just need to follow it up. That's all. Are you asking if what if they don't follow? Is that the question you are asking? I didn't understand. No, we can, no, he's uh, asking we can how do you make them how to make them follow? How to make them follow? Because how do you make them to do that? They don't have a choice. I don't think they have a choice. Yeah, yeah they, they don't have a choice. They have to follow. Not have a choice. They are, it's an act. From the yeah, council, so that, if it comes, they have to do it. They should not have a choice. Probably. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. They, they don't have a choice. No university will have a choice. Yes. Yeah. They can always have a better curriculum. Yes. Always teach more than what is there. Yeah. But we can't teach anything less than that. Also, uh, Adi, also related to education, um, you know, I know both of us um, have discussed this a lot, and I know Neera and me also have discussed this uh, at some point of time. You know, the the very um, popular trend of uh, new graduates. Uh, getting admission into masters and also being faculty for the undergraduates, <laughs> uh, awesome. you know, without any experience and stuff like that. That's uh, you know we've discussed this. This is a huge trend that's happening. Um, so, you know, any any thoughts on on that? 
in terms of regulation and stuff? Yeah, so that's uh, that's where we came up with this uh, uh, faculty upgradation yesterday, wherein uh, yes, I did bring out this point and uh, about the master's program. We did not start masters in teaching. <laughs> we started masters in clinical optometry. Okay, if you read any of the syllabi or the curricula of uh, master's program, it is masters in clinical optometry. You become a clinical optometrist after that and not a teacher. It has become a step ladder to faculty position, which is wrong. You may do PhD, that is perfectly okay. <coughs> you may do MPhil, that's again perfectly okay. But then masters in clinical optometry is for your clinical training, clinical uh, upgradation, because the the competency that is there for the bachelor's program is very different as the competency for master's program. We do not teach a number of things what we're teaching in master's clinical program in the bachelor's program, depending upon that is based on the requirements of the country, the healthcare requirements of the country, right? So they have to do, uh, I mean, uh, uh, doing a master's program in clinical optometry is definitely not a step ladder to faculty position. They have to do a pedagogy. They have to, so we are working on it. I don't know how the things are going to change over a period of time. Uh, probably something like BA, MA, or something, or maybe some other terminology might uh, pop in. We don't know. Again, early times to talk about it, but then... Yeah. These are my thoughts on uh, masters in uh, clinical optometry. We are creating clinicians and not teachers alone. So yeah. yes, related to all structures related to it. So you have uh, it is it has been in process about the uh, masters. Uh, how, how, what 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 will be the uh, how they need to be start when they can teach. So after how many years and what would be the structure of their uh, salary and everything will also come up probably in that. So uh, it's all there in the. Uh, CMOC. The, CMOC. Uh, the ratified curriculum has that. Ratified. So uh, I can assure you, you'll have a, you'll not have a old wine and new bottle. Yeah. You'll have a new <laughs> wine and a better bottle. <laughs> so, uh, we are not just going to copy paste thing and uh, change the cover alone. We are going to change uh, a lot of things. So all those things are being discussed and uh, give give us about a month more before you have the latest curriculum. Yeah. And uh, you'll see all the changes in that. Probably last one comment or one uh, message. Uh, how we are looking uh, future of optometry? <laughs> <laughs> Probably a uh, lot of questions we have answered. Yes, some of the answers uh, we already or we are knowing that uh, we, we won't be able to say it at, that, at this point of time. Uh, maybe time comes and we will be able to answer everything. Uh, but still, this might be a difficult one to think from uh, what would be the future. But in terms of how 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 you see, sir? Ramna, you take that first. Yeah, yes, sir. You can. See. Okay. Uh, you see, uh, I, I can I can you know I uh, uh, you see if I go back to 1983 when I was with my father, uh, he was also an optometrist at Eluru, Andhra Pradesh. So. At that time, the optometry, how it was, and now how it is, is a, there's a huge, you know, a transformation happened, actually. You see, uh, you see, at that time, when we joined, you know, there was no degree in, the, in, in entire India. There was only diploma program in India. So the degree started. Then we wanted to do post-graduation. There was no post-graduation course in India. Post-graduation started. And uh, uh, there was no PhDs, uh, PhD in India in optometry. Then people used to uh, go out of India and do PhDs. Now we have PhDs. There are so many fellowship programs. And, uh, and of course, as Lakshmi was telling, a lot of CMEs are happening now. You just go back uh, 20 years back and see and how it is now. There is a tremendous transformation of optometry profession uh, definitely in India. And the, now, in fact, it is picking up after the uh, act is passed in 2021. So I definitely see a you know a very bright future for optometrists uh, in India. And in fact, I 
uh, I, I keep telling my students here, I think the time has come now to celebrate Indian Optometry Day. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. You know, uh, you see, now the entire world is following India, yes. Indian mm. leaders. So uh, we should be the leaders, actually. We should set the, you know, uh, path to uh, others. You see, uh, like, you know, I have, I, have, I have been to Europe last year, you know, uh, in some countries there, you know, optometry is not, it's in a very primitive stage. Uh, and if you compare that, you see, when I told them the optometry is there, uh, that about our act, they were so happy to hear that. So in India, the act is passed and the independent practice for optometrists, all these things are a very, 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 very good sign for optometrists across India. Uh, I see a bright, in, and as I told you, we, I think probably by next year, we should start celebrating a different day, Indian Optometry Day. So that's the kind of future I'm seeing for optometry. Yes, Aditya sir, uh, your, your point on how you look. Uh... I see Indian Optometry without any aberrations, <laughs> <laughs> and without any refractive errors. <laughs> Refractive errors for the oh, human. That we will correct better. anyway. We are optometrists. We do that corrections. No, no, no. Optomet. I am talking of optometry. Yeah. Indian optometry will not be myopic. Yeah. Indian <laughs> optometry is not short sighted. Yeah. Exactly. Indian optometry is not going to be a hyperopic or with astigmatism. Yeah. And definitely no aberrations. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I think like what Kevya said, you know, uh, here is a country which uh, has set an example of how to move from self-regulation to government regulation. I think we've given an example of that to many countries, you know, many countries in Asia Pacific region. And as uh, Ramana said, many European and uh, uh, Middle Eastern countries, which do not have regulation. I think here we are with an example of how to go about uh, that from self-regulation to government regulation. I think that's a huge uh, step. Um, and uh, as uh, Adi said, I think uh, we are going to set a trend uh, in terms of uh, optometry and eye care. And it's not necessary that it, it follows what happens in the West. It can be different because the needs are very different. Yeah, the population exactly. is huge. Uh, the reach has to be very different. So I think we might set a different path in terms of reaching uh, the population, uh, you know, through eye care. I think that is going to be very, very different. One thing that I would just like to say, which I think even I mentioned this morning uh, in the CME is, I think people are fed up of seeing Aditya's face, my face, <laughs> and, you know, uh, other faces where we just keep uh, repeating ourselves. I think we need young leaders. Uh, in we have Nero here. Sorry? That's why we have Nero now. Yes, correct. <laughs> Absolutely right. Absolutely right. No, I think we, so need... we, will, we will fade away and the young souls will come in. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's going to be a great transition, um, you know, and I think uh, um, optometrists such as you and the other generation optometrists need to take up that mantle and move forward. Um, and I feel that there is a lot of interest in that direction. Uh, as well. So that's going to be good. No, Adi? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. That's the reason why uh, I keep uh, saying that we should have, we should groom our future generations. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. unless we groom, the entire profession will be dead with us. Yeah. Anita, you want to take up the questions which you're putting on chat because we can't read them. So can you? Uh, direct the questions to whoever concerned? I guess most of them have been answered in the course of the uh, panel discussion, Lakshmi. Um, just give me a moment. And I think it's going to be a great transition. So unless we grew, the entire profit. I thought we heard our own voices. Yeah. I think most of them have been really comments, I would say, adding up more to what uh, you people have been discussing in general. So um, 
there's nothing, no question per se, I can see from the chat box. It's more of comments and uh, agreement to what uh, all of you have been discussing. Like you mentioned, uh, Lakshmi, the future is definitely bright. And with the NCHP Act in place, I think we can look forward to a very bright future and a future of certainty, unlike what it was when you guys started or when I also entered the profession. It was a lot of uncertainty. But now I think with the act in place and uh, with the council also in place very shortly, I think uh, things are going to be streamlined and we can look forward to a host of activities. And like you also mentioned, continuing education should be part of our professional um, you know, journey and uh, take it up vigorously, not just for students, but as practitioners, we need to take time out of our busy practices See, uh, everything um, you need to take time out. That is all I can say. Uh, update and upgrade yourself. It should be the key mantra for each one of us. So, I mean, I, I've just given my comments on the entire thing. Um, so, uh, I have a question, Adi, for you and Kavya. Uh, so, uh, you know, we've been battling with these state councils and sometimes there's no response and stuff like that. So, what's going to happen with, uh, with regards to that, can you both comment? Uh, you want to know what will happen if there's no state council? Yeah, if they're reluctant in forming one, because sometimes okay. some states so, have different governments. So that particular that. state uh, comes under the central council. Ah, okay. It is there in the act. It is written in the so MCA. It is very much there but... in the act. No, I know. I just wanted And secondly, yeah. uh, again, a question was raised about union territories. Okay, so some of the union territories go with a neighboring state. Ah, okay, that's news. For example, Damandiu can go with Gujarat. Okay. Okay, Pondicherry can come with Tamil Nadu. They can have their own if they want to, but if they do not want to, for whatever reason, they can go with a neighboring state. And there is definite clarity that uh, people who have graduated from vocational courses will not come under the register? Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Again, That's you like I said, you'll see a revamped uh, curriculum and uh, the guidelines. It'll all be put in that, okay. and all this will be put on the website of the commission. Commission. So we cannot stop anyone from doing illegal work. If someone is doing something illegal, they are doing it at their risk, and uh, there is no recognition. There is basically, no recognition. they will not be accepted. Yes. Yeah. So I guess when you see the future, like what Neera was asking, I think uh, optometrists will be seen as qualified professionals by the public. Uh, that's where I see the future uh, once the register is in place and all of that. And people will, um, you know, go to qualified uh, practitioners to get their eyes uh, examined, I guess. And I think uh, we should stop writing qualified optometrists because there cannot be any unqualified optometrists. <laughs> no, what I mean to say, no, what I mean to say is people who have registered under the. Uh, I agree. I mean, uh, I see a number of signboards saying qualified optometrists available. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 So, optometry is an educated profession. You cannot have an unqualified optometrist. So I think a lot of questions which I was having the doubts and a lot of questions which were thinking. Uh, definitely, this is never ending topic and never ending process to think. But uh, what at the end, I would definitely say that yes, future is bright and we are moving ahead on the good uh, areas and good uh, process. So I think uh, the act and everything once it's done, uh, it's definitely going to change a lot of things. So I really wish and we will see and everything uh, different in future a uh, lot of new questions once it comes we'll uh, we will get to hear from both of you so sure. thank you thank sure. you uh, sir uh, thank you uh, aditya sir thank you thank, thank you very much thank you for having us neera yeah and, i and, i'd uh, like to thank neera because here is a very complicated setup that you've done <laughs> Uh, for this we could see you. We could see you squirming here, there. Yeah, yeah, a lot of, lot of, uh, lot of effort that's gone into this. And uh, uh, thank you, Neera, for thank hosting you. this. And I think for any young optometric college, I think Harijot is a huge example to follow. The way they have grown from a small college to what it is now, 
with so much faculty and good quality faculty uh, within their program, I, I would really say this is, you know, a, a, a big example uh, to, to follow for other colleges where things are done, they have processes, uh, they have systems in place. Um, I wish all optometric colleges were the same. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your Thank you. kind words. It's a really a, a whole day. It was like a good event for me, uh, World Optometry Day and uh, spending with all the mentors and all, all of them. Uh, thank you for this opportunity also to uh, host this. And um, really a lot of questions which were in my mind uh, related to the act and all as given uh, good uh, enlightenment, enlightenment on uh, how we, will, we are going in future. And students, when they ask questions, I think now we are as a faculty, as an educator, as a head, we can give some, some good information to the practitioners as well, those who are in nearby as well. I think that's a really a good uh, way we are working on. You know, just to add uh, one last thing, this year we are celebrating World Optometry Week. So we can continue for another seven days. Yeah, yes, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> definitely. Yes. And uh, thanks to Anita and Sakina, the people who are in the background and Bhavya uh, for uh, you know helping us to live stream. And I also would like to thank Optician India. They have partnered with us in live streaming this in their uh, platform as well. So thanks to uh, all of you who have worked towards uh, you know this uh, particular event. Thank you so much on behalf of Optometry Council of India for this very stimulative, uh, stimulating panel discussion, I would say it was very, very informative. And I hope the 2000 plus live audience today who are watching this panel discussion benefited greatly with this. And a lot many doubts have also been cleared up with this. And if there are any more questions from the audience, you can always mail to us at info at the rate optometrycouncilofindia.org. We will put it across to the panelists uh, who joined us today, especially uh, Mr. Aditya and Dr. Venkat Ramna, who are the interim council members representing the optometry fraternity. Uh, they will be very happy to answer your questions if there are anything beyond this discussion. So on this note, a uh, very goodbye from all of us over here. Thank you so much for joining us again. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.